All right, welcome to part two of topics 2.1 and 2.2 for AP Precalculus over change in arithmetic and geometric sequences or change in exponential and linear functions. Now, in the first part, hopefully you learned a lot about arithmetic sequences, but in this part, we're going to learn all about geometric sequences. Now, let's first remind you what a sequence is. It's literally just a list of numbers that have some type of pattern to them. Now, a geometric sequence is a very specific type of sequence where we see a common ratio or proportional change change between consecutive terms. Now this common ratio is basically the rate of change that we would see in an exponential function. To really just kind of simplify it, we're multiplying by the same value between every single term. So we're simply multiplying, multiplying, multiplying by the same value. And when you multiply every term by the same value, you grow or decrease exponentially, which means proportionally, right? Not too bad. So first, before we dive too into too many examples, let's look at the formula to generate the terms of a geometric sequence. All right, here it is. So this is a formula to find any term we want for our geometric sequence. So we're gonna use g sub n, g for geometric sequence. Now, here is the formula. We have g sub k times r raised to the n minus k. All right, let's try to make sure we understand what all this is. R is the common ratio. It's simply what it is that we're multiplying every term by. And when we look at an example, you're gonna see how easy it is to find that. Now, K is simply any term we want. If you wanna be the third term, K is gonna be three. If you wanna use the first term, K is gonna be one. If you wanna use the 10th term, K is gonna be 10. G sub K is the value of that term. So K and G sub K, it's like a point, right? You got your input K and your output G sub K. It's really that simple. It's, so all you need to know to build this formula is the common ratio. What is it that you're multiplying by every single term? And then you need to know any one term of that sequence. K is the term number. G sub K is the value of that term. Now this is all gonna make a lot more sense as soon as we start taking a look at some examples. Here's our first example, 4, 12, 36, 108, 324, a list of numbers. Now the first thing we have to do is figure out what our common ratio is. What is it that we're multiplying by? Really, really easy to figure out. All you gotta do is divide any two consecutive terms. 12 divided by 4 is 3, 36 divided by 12 is 3, 108 divided by 36 is 3, you get the point. So our common ratio, what we're multiplying by over and over and over again is 3. Now to generate the formula, all we need to know is any one term. We actually know five terms here, we just need to use one of them. So let's use the third term. We know the third term is 36. So we're gonna to go to our formula. The first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna substitute three in for r. That's the common ratio, what we're multiplying by. Then k is the term that we picked. We picked the third term, so our k value is three. And then g sub k is the value of that third term, which is 36. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky because we like this form. Again, there's nothing wrong with this form, 36 times three raised to the n minus three. It's gonna work. If you wanna find the thousandth term, just plug in a thousand and you'll get the thousandth term. If you wanna plug in 62 to get the 62nd term, just plug in 62. But we do wanna clean this up. And this is gonna kind of be important for what's coming next. But how do we clean this up? We just simply have to use a couple of our basic rules of exponents. All right, the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna separate three to the n and three to the negative three. Remember, when you have a common base, you're allowed to add your exponents. So if I had three to the n and three to the negative three, I could combine that to three raised to the n minus three, which is where I started. So I'm just splitting that apart. I'm taking apart the three to the n and the three to the negative three. Now three to the n is, well, three to the n until I know n, I don't know what that is, so I'm gonna shove that to the right. Three to the negative three is one over 27. Remember, negative exponents don't make you negative, and negative exponent just moves you to the denominator where you can have a positive exponent. So three to the third is 27, but that has to go to our denominator. So three raised to negative three is one over 27. I could then multiply that by the 36 to get 36 over 27, which reduces to four thirds. So this is simply another version of the formula we built. We built 36 times three raised to the n minus three, but just simplifying it using our rules of exponents, we get four thirds times three raised to the n. Now, when you just have a single variable n in your exponent, most people view that as a little bit easier, a little bit more simplified. And of course, that looks like an exponential function, which is exactly what geometric sequences are, exponential functions, with the only difference of you're only allowed to plug in positive whole numbers into sequences. All right, so that's just a way to clean it up. A lot of kids may be like, 
do I have to do that? Well, no, it all depends, but think of a multiple choice where the final answer is four thirds times three to the n, and that's not what you got when you use the formula, but if you know how to use rules of exponent, it really works. All right, now I want to prove to you one more thing. Remember I said to generate the formula of a geometric sequence, you need the common ratio, in this case three, and then you need any term. I just used the third term, but again, you could use any term you want. So let's use the fifth term just to show that I would get the exact same final answer. So the fifth term is 324. So when I go to generate my formula, I'm gonna sub in three for R, that's what I'm multiplying by. I'm gonna sub in five for K, because I'm looking at the fifth term. And then the value of that fifth term is G sub K, which is 324. So again, I'm done. That is a formula to find any term I want. Again, you wanna find the, 30th through the 33rd term? Plug in 33 and you'll get the 33rd term. But we would like to simplify this. That way we can make sure it's the exact same thing we got in the previous example where we used the third term. So once again, what we're going to do is we're going to separate the 3 to the n and the 3 to the negative 5 using our exponent rules. 3 to the n, we don't know until we know what n is, so we're going to move that to the back. 3 to the negative 5 is 1 over 243. The 3 moves the denominator with the positive 5 as the exponent, and that's 243. Then we're going to multiply 324 times 1 over 243, and we get 324 over 243, which, guess what, reduces to 4 thirds. So our final result here is that the formula is 4 thirds times 3 raised to the n, which is the exact same thing we got as our final answer when we used the third term. And I could have used the first term, the second term, any term. Now I will say this, as you start to do these problems, it does make sense to use the first term because when you go to do the simplification, it's a lot easier to simplify when you have that um, three raised to the n minus one for the first term. But I'm just trying to prove to you, it does not matter what term you use. And if you know your rules of exponents, it really shouldn't matter. You'll get that same final answer. Now in this form, four thirds times three to the n, this looks more like our exponential form that we definitely want to be in. So it's really important that you know how to get to this form. Now, the three represents our, our rate of change. It's the constant value that we're multiplying by. The four thirds represents our initial value. So if there was a zeroth term, if there was a term before the first term, which in a function there would be, but in a sequence there is not, but if there was, that's what the four thirds would represent. And all you gotta do is plug in zero to see that. If I plug in zero, three to the zero is one, four thirds times one is four thirds. But technically I can't plug in zero because in a sequence, the first term is by plugging in one. But again, that's the whole point I'm trying to teach you is that if there was an initial value, that's what that four thirds would represent. All right, let's look at another example here of a geometric sequence, 72, 24, eight, eight thirds, eight nines, dot, 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 it goes on forever. The first thing we always have to do is determine what is the common ratio that we're multiplying by. And how do you do that? Just divide any two consecutive terms. 24 divided by 72 is one third. Eight divided by 24 is one third. Eight thirds divided by eight is one third. So this time we're multiplying by one third. All that means is that we're getting smaller, not larger, but we're still multiplying by the same value over and over and over, one third. So now remember to generate our formula, we need the common ratio, one third, and any term we want. Let's use the second term for this problem, the second term of, of course, 24. So we're gonna substitute in one third for our R, our constant ratio. Then we're gonna substitute in a two for the K value because we're using the second term. And then A sub K is 24, that's the value of the second term. Now this is an awesome formula, this formula will generate any term you want, but we would like to simplify it. So again, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna separate the one third to the the n and the one third to the negative two. Now one third to the n, we don't know because we don't know what n is, so we're gonna move that to the back. One third raised to negative two. Listen, if you need a calculator to do that, go ahead, but you really shouldn't. You should know that what's gonna happen is we don't like that negative exponent, so we're gonna to have to move the negative two to the denominator, and that's gonna make a positive nine. Again, it's kind of tricky, but you have to understand is that when you have one third raised to negative two, you have one to the negative two on top, and then you have three to the negative two on the bottom. Now, one raised to anything is one, but that three to the negative two on the bottom is gonna to move to the top, so that's a positive two, and that's where it becomes a nine. Now, to understand that, you have to go back to Algebra 2 where you hopefully had a good teacher that taught you some really good um, exponent rules. But use your calculator if you need to, but ex essentially one third raised to negative two is nine. Then we're gonna multiply 24 by nine to get 216. So we have 216 times one third raised to the n. Really, really simple. But again, we like this form better because we could see our common ratio of one third and we see 216, which is our initial value. If there was an initial value, if there was a value before the zero. Now, as I've said multiple times, 
You don't have to use the second term. You can use any term you want. So let's do the whole problem over again one more time where let's use the fourth term. The fourth term is eight thirds. So here we go. We're gonna substitute one third in for R, we're gonna substitute four in for K, and we're gonna substitute eight thirds in for, eight, uh, for G sub K. That's the value of our third term. Now again, there's nothing wrong with this formula, but we would like to clean it up. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna take that one third to the end and that one third to the negative four, we're gonna separate them. One third to the end is gonna to move to the back because we don't know what n is. And then one third to the negative four is 81. Use a calculator if you need to or understand that that three is gonna take on a negative four, but it's in the denominator, so it's gonna to move to the numerator because that's a positive and three to the fourth is 81. Eight thirds times 81 is gonna to reduce to 216 and we get the exact same equation for our final answer that we did when we used the second term. And I'll say it one more time, most kids are gonna jump and use the first term because the math is always a little bit easier. I know I didn't show it that way because I kinda wanna show you the trickier math, but if you use the first term, the math is a little bit easier. All right, and then again, don't forget in this final form, the one third represents the value that we're constantly multiplying by and the 216 represents, well, the initial value if there was one. Now it's really important for you to understand everything I've been trying to explain to you, geometric sequences and exponential functions are the same, just different representations. If we say f of x, that's great. If we say g sub n, hey, here's a formula for any term of a geometric sequence. The big difference is whole numbers are all you're allowed to plug in to a sequence. Plug in one, two, three, four, five. Whereas an exponential function, well, you can plug in anything you want. There's no, there's no limit, you can plug in any value you want, all real numbers. That's the big difference between a geometric sequence and an exponential function. Now, let's further understand the connection between the two by looking at the general forms. On the left-hand side here, we see the general form of a geometric sequence, as I just got done explaining. R is that common ratio that we're multiplying by. And K, G sub K, it's like a point. The first term, the second term, or the third term, the fourth term, whatever one you want. K is the term that we're looking at. G sub K is the value of that term. Now, for an exponential uh, function, we have this generic form where we have uh, any point we want, x1, comma y1, and then we have our common ratio r. And this is a formula to generate any form we want, right, of that exponential function. Uh, we have r, the common ratio that we're multiplying by, and then we have x minus x, and then y. But again, all you have to understand is that x and y are just any point of that exponential function. Just like in a geometric sequence, I could use any term and its value to generate the formula. Now, in an exponential function, most people think of as um, you know, very, very simple a times b raised to the x, where we have b is our common ratio, a is that initial value and raised to the x. So just be aware you may see that come up very often, but that's why when we were working with our geometric sequences, I focus on really reducing it to that generic form of a times b raised to the n, where we have a, our initial value, and b, our common ratio, whether you call it r or b, it doesn't really matter that we're multiplying by. All right, now one more cool thing when it comes to geometric and arithmetic sequences, as well as exponential linear functions, is this. They are the only two functions in the entire world that the formula for them can be found by only knowing two points, any two points. Now, if it's a function, that's two points. If it's a sequence, that's two terms. But a point is that that's pretty cool that these are the only functions in the world that if you just have two pieces of information about that function, about that sequence, you could generate a formula for any one you want. Now in the previous video, I talked about one for arithmetic. Now let's talk about one for geometric. So let's look at this example here where we know two pieces of information about an exponential function or a geometric sequence. So if it's a function, we maybe know two points, three comma 56 and five comma 224. If it's a sequence, we might know two terms, the third term is 56, and the fifth term is 224. Now, how can we use these two pieces of information to generate a formula for our exponential function or geometric sequence? So let's show how we could do this first through the eyes of an exponential function. So we're gonna start off with the two points, three comma 56 and five comma 224. Now we're gonna start with our very generic exponential function, a times b raised to the x. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna create two formulas using our two points. So we know that y equals a times b to the x. We could use the first point, three comma 56. The y is 56, the x is three. 
And then the second point, the Y is 224 and the X is five. Then we're gonna do a little bit of substitution. So we're gonna solve the first equation for A by dividing by B cubed. So we get 56 divided by B cubed equals A. Then we're gonna substitute that value for A into the other equation. So the A becomes 56 over B cubed. Now we're gonna use our rules of exponents, a B to the fifth divided by B cubed is gonna, you could subtract those exponents, five minus three is two, or you could look at you know, three of the B's on the top, cancel with three of the B's on the bottom, leaving behind a B squared, however you wanna view that. So we get 224 equals 56 times B squared, Subtra or excuse me, not subtract, divide the 56 over, 224 divided by 56 is four. Then how do you get rid of a square? Well, you could use the square root or you could raise each side to the one half power. A one half power is the same thing as the square root. So four to the one half is two, B squared to the one half is just B. So there's our B value of two. Now to find A, we're gonna go back to that equation we started with that we solved for A, 56 over B cubed equals A. We're gonna substitute in the value for B that we just found. So we get 56 divided by two cubed, two cubed is eight, 56 divided by eight is seven. So we have our final answer of our exponential function in its most basic lowest form, B times, excuse me, A times B to the X, which in this case is seven times two raised to the X. How cool is that and how simple is that? And all we need to know is those two points. No other function besides linear functions can this be done with. All right, now what about if we looked at this through the eyes of a geometric sequence where the third term is 56 and the fifth term is 224? Now here we'd have to say, okay, if I am at the third term, g sub three, and I wanna get to the fifth term, g sub five, I would need to multiply by two ratios. I would need to multiply by r to get to the fourth term, and then multiply by r again to get to the fifth term. Well, r times r is of course r squared. So I would need to multiply by r times r, r twice, to get from that third term to that fifth term. All right, very, very simple to set that up. How easy is that? Now I'm simply gonna substitute in the fifth term, which is 224, substitute in the third term, which is 56. Again, I knew that from my terms. And then divide the 56 over, I get four. How do you get rid of a square? You could use a square root or a one half power. Four to the one half is two. R squared to the one half is R. So there's my R value. Uh, kind of looked pretty similar to when we solved for B. Then now, remember, as we learned about in the very beginning of this video, I only need two things to generate the formula for any term of a geometric sequence. The common ratio, which I just found out to be two, and any term. Now I know two terms, the third and the fifth. Let's use the third term, it does not matter. So if I use the third term, I'm gonna plug in three for K, the third term, and I know that that third term is 56. Then I'm gonna go ahead and do that cleanup. I'm gonna separate the two to the N and the two to the negative three. I'm gonna to move to the two to the N in the back because I don't know what N is. Two to the negative three is one eighth. 56 times one eighth is seven. So I get my final formula for my geometric sequence, seven times two raised to the N. And of course that should look pretty familiar because that's the exact same thing I got when I treated this as an exponential function. So you see exponential functions and geometric sequences really are the same thing and they have this really cool unique attribute where if you know any two terms or any two points, you can use a little bit of simple math. Like I didn't do anything overly difficult here to generate either the formula for the exponential function or the formula for the geometric sequence. All right, that's it for geometric sequences and a little bit of the beginning of an exponential functions. Now, all we have to remember is that when you're talking about exponential function or geometric sequence over equal length input value intervals, we see a proportional change between our terms. You know, as long as we have those consecutive equal length input value intervals, you know, you know, two to three to four to five, or maybe you could go by fives, you know, two to seven to 12, whatever, you'll see a proportional change between your output values and you're multiplying by a constant over that time. All right, that's it. Hopefully it made a lot of sense and hopefully you enjoyed it. Hopefully you learned a lot. We'll see you in the next video.